when Hugh first came to visit by the farm uh, last September. Uh, we sat down and we had a bit of a chat about what I was doing there and some of the methods I used and what my food production was like. So now I've got a chance to say all those <laughs> questions to you. Turn it round uh, and ask you, uh, why do you grow your own food? Mm -hmm. And are there any methods in particular that you're using? And how much of your own food do you grow? Great questions. I'll try and remember them all. If I forget answering something, just let me know. Oh, um, <laughs> first reason why I grow food was because I grew up with it. Um, I highly doubt that had this not been part of my childhood, A, I probably wouldn't have known it really existed. Uh, B, if I did know, then I just have this perception that it's kind of just older people that did it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's quite quite um, a, a interesting angle because you don't really perceive a young person to be into gardening. It's more kind of gaming um, and sport and things like that. And I actually really enjoy those as well. But I think it's because this has been embedded as part of my early life. When I was three, my parents used to encourage me to come out here and they didn't just give me the mundane tasks like weeding and stuff um, because they knew that would put me off probably. Um, so it was more about encouraging me to sow and grow things and I, I really wish more parents would do that for their kids, I think, because yeah. you know you learn so many important kind of values. Yeah. So one of them is respect and and you have a lot more respect for the food because you, you understand the care that's had to be put into it all the attention to detail and and the other thing as well is it's not just respect um but also patience and you know i love instant gratification it is it's kind of built into every single young person but gardening really just slows everything down and it teaches you to be patient um, and I would hate to know how impatient I would be had I not done some gardening because uh, yeah I'm, all, I'm already impatient enough <laughs> so, <laughs> and then the way I, I grow food it's I could have a play on words here it's low dig it's not no dig it's not high dig it's low dig and what i mean by that is around 70 to 80 percent of what we grow here involves no digging um if we do have to dig um it's mainly the potatoes and for example this year with getting in all the compost because it's actually a really strong compost it's more of a looks great actually yeah. it's looking really good it's, it's really nice but i felt that when i did some seed tests that it's kind of maybe a bit too strong um so i kind of forked it into the top layer of the soil and you know everything um is, is looking really good apart from the brassicas which i think they're just still settling in and um, they haven't even been in a week but yeah, I've been enjoying really good crops and germination rate as well. But yeah, it's low dig. Um, I think as gardeners, we're now beginning to understand how important it is to feed the soil and look after the soil yeah. rather than trying to feed the plants. And I think we can all thank Charles Dowding for that as well. Yeah. Um, so, so that's what we use. Um, no chemicals whatsoever. It's been organic since, since the start. We try and keep down on weeds usually by hoeing there aren't like too many weeds about if there are i don't really worry about them um i'll just usually pull them up um quite often by hand even with stinging nettles um i don't you know weeds what you've got to understand it's just uh, nature's way of protecting the soil yeah. um so one of the things that i do is if i'm trying to grow something for example say the radish or or the beetroot is if you plant really intensively it already covers the soil and, and weeds are less likely to grow um, and then yeah we we do kind of practice crop rotation um, but we don't stick um, strict to it i don't think you need to be strict with it i think you could 
you know you could probably get away with doing everything in the same um, place twice um, for a lot of things actually um, and, and there are lots of veg which don't fit to crop rotation for example your squash and your runner beans and your lettuce um, so you can keep these in the in the same a place, same location every growing season and, and by learning things like that you can make your planning a lot more efficient um, and ultimately make growing food a lot more efficient and in terms of then your final question how much food do we grow mm. it's really I'd say um, the garden sources most of our, our veg throughout the year you know with potatoes we're, we're basically self-sufficient with potatoes um, the Hungry Gap, oh, we've had so much purple sprouting broccoli and kale shoots uh, this year, so much leeks, um, it's been amazing. Uh, the Swede have done well, um, but one thing that we haven't done, and I think the reason why is because it seems a bit overwhelming, is when you're harvesting something to weigh everything as well. And Which is what I did last year, and that was it's so <laughs> much extra work. It is, because you're growing food for us it's to be more self-sufficient and it's kind of a bit off-putting you know you want to quickly grab something from the garden and then you just put another step of of weighing it um, but what I can tell you is that a substantial part of our diet especially from kind of um, May June until January uh, definitely most of our food comes from this space amazing and I, I believe um, that, that's in terms of, of vegetables um, and we have lots of soft fruit as well. We're there are masses inundated. of fruit plants. Yeah. yeah. Um, so from where I'm sitting here I can see uh, gooseberries and currants, uh, there are uh, blackberries and yeah, silverberries and berries. pears. Just there's so yeah. much fruit all around, and, and I think Hugh's made a video in the past about his edible hedging yeah. and your windbreaks, and all of the all of the hedges, the edges, the trellises are all just chock a block with fruit. Yeah, and and I think as well, it's it's kind of being more of a, a kitchen garden type of thing. Um, and so we have a huge range of things, also perennial veg like Jerusalem artichokes and, and um, rhubarb as well. So it's just having a really big mix of things. Um, and also something that I think is really important is, you know, ev every year we'll have something which goes slightly wrong. Um, but the thing that I tell to people, because so many people give up if, if they just focus too much on the negatives, yeah. But you know what? There's always next growing season. That, and that's the great you know? thing about gardening. It just, you know, it's, yeah. there's always next time, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Hugh, I know, <laughs> I know other people have asked you, uh, so I'm going to ask you too. <laughs> Why do you have grass uh, in, between your, in between your vegetable beds? Yeah, if I had a pound for every time I got asked that question. Um, I understand the question. Uh, the main... The main fear that people have are slugs, I believe, which is why they're horrified to see grass pathways. Uh, so what we do, um, actually, the main, it's a lot of kind of prevention and attacking strategies with slugs. But the most important thing is slugs actually like a lot longer grass. Because the thing is with grass like this, if you try and keep it short, and it actually needs another cut soon. Um, but when you keep it short it, it dries out during the day so slugs can't hide there during the day they prefer to hide in much thicker grass um, which holds the moisture um, so, th so that's one of the things and we also um, attack our slugs with ducks so if you have india runner ducks or khaki campbells um, they're really good for um, eradicating slugs and we have very very low slug problems here and so many people as well um, try this and say that their slug uh, that the ducks have have eaten all of the the veg plants as well so i'm gonna actually be doing a video just so we can go through all those different things and the different tricks that i use to make sure that they don't um, affect our crops so it's actually been really wet here for the past couple of weeks and it's given a big chance for slugs to to populate but i hardly really find any at all um i'm really looking for slug damage <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. It's just not here. You, you, I can't see any. Yeah. Any obvious signs of slug damage at all. And that there's so many different things. You know, not not everyone can keep ducks. And I think Tony did a really good video about nematodes. Yeah. Um, and those are, those are quite exciting as well. Um, I've. I kind of use those in the past, but I don't need to because I just keep the grass short um, and use the ducks. Um, uh, and the other thing I think as well, which is quite important, is I try and pick up, and I know you can see bits of pots and stuff on the ground, but you know, look under those and you can actually use those as traps. Mm -hmm. So if you want to put some seed trays on the ground, you can then come the next morning turn them over and that's where you'll find a lot of slugs hiding. So there's just loads of different things that we do and beer traps work well, but if you haven't got slugs, I wouldn't say to actually use beer traps because you're actually going to end up trying to attract them to your veg plot anyway and that's very counterproductive. Hey, thank you so much for today. Thank you for showing uh, what we're allowing me to show everybody. That was fine.